Hey, hello. Mary Harrington is an author I became familiar with in the COVID time, reading her on unheard, U-N-H-E-R-D dot com. Her book is Feminism Against Progress, described on the back cover as a stark warning against a dystopian future in which poor women become little more than convenient sources of body parts to be harvested and wombs to be rented by the rich. Progress no longer benefits the majority of women and only a feminism that is skeptical of it can truly defend their interests in the 21st century. So Harrington describes her youth, uh, quote, drenched in queer theology and adrift in the endless possibilities of digital culture. It suddenly felt possible to reimagine our genders in bespoke terms and to create supportive enough communities to somehow realize our inner lives in the world, unquote. For a period she lived in online life as a virtual male, she called herself Sebastian. But eventually she became untangled from all that, uh, resumed her sense of being a female person. Harrington is not a theologian or necessarily even a Christian. I don't, don't really know her faith. She grew up in Britain uh, in postmodernism, imbibing feminism as a child, but now she rejects much of what presently is defined as feminism. That's what drew me to her book. I wondered, I wanna, I wanna hear more. How did this happen? What is her thought? She describes a crucial worldview which she calls progress theology. Uh, let me read it to you from her page. Quote, legal scholar Adrian Vermeule has dis dissected what he calls sacramental liberalism, a lived and very concrete type of political theological order representing an imperfectly secularized offshoot of Christianity. This quasi-theological regime, he argues, takes as its central sacrament the disruption of existing norms. In the pursuit of an ever-receding goal of greater freedom, transformation, and progress towards some undefined future goal of absolute human perfection that we somehow never attain, and whose externalities are never counted, save as further evidence of how far progress still has to go. This is the core of progress theology. The key, she says, is to notice the underlying structure of belief that there exists a kind of axis along which progress can be measured and that we are inexorably moving along that axis from more bad to less bad, she says. Harrington says that she does not believe in progress theology. Now, here's an insight, and most of us are adherents of progress theology, we are. If I asked you to tell me your life story, you would likely frame it in terms of progress from less good to more good. You came from this background, you came from this understanding to that understanding, to, from, away from this misconception. You came to this corrected understanding. You were born in a small town and you, you worked for minimum wage at the hardware store, but now you went to school and you live in suburbia and you make good money, you make more money, you have a house, you have a good car, and you have, you have this list of gadgets or whatever. Yours is a story of progress upward. We want to think that things are improving, and so we tell the story, automatically, really, so that we are moving from less good to more good. I think there's some human nature going on there. But I think there's something more here also, as she's pointing out. There's something built into us, you know, about this framing, or less preferably, really what we're talking about is spinning. We spin our stories. Harrington is telling us that the actual story of feminism has been framed, spun, portrayed differently than it works out to in fact. I was especially interested in her critique, her explicit critique of contemporary feminism. Listen to this in her words. What we call feminism today is for the most part this worldview, the team freedom one, which should more accurately be called bio-libertarianism, the doctrine that legitimizes the vision of men and women as meat lego and which is taking on increasingly pseudo-religious overtones. This doctrine focuses on extending individual freedom and self-fashioning as far as possible into the realm of the body, stripped alike of physical, cultural, and reproductive dimorphism in favor of a self-created human autonomy. This protean condition is pursued ostensibly in the name of progress." Unquote. Mainstream feminism has morphed, uh, says Harrington, into a, quote, movement focused almost entirely on individual freedom imagined as the property of functionally interchangeable humans. And she asks how pro-women is a movement now aimed at transcending our sexed bodies in favor of a genderless human state. Quote, the end point of a three-century struggle for progress 
understood as individual separateness has culminated in a political effort to eliminate all meaningful sex differences through technology, unquote. Is she overstating her case? I, I, I don't think so. She is accurately observing that what one would think has to do with making real improvements for women instead has turned into something anti or opposite the interests of women. There has been a shift in worldview that is actually antagonistic to humanity that devalues not only maleness, but femaleness. Nature is in the way, and we need to transcend nature to have the freedom. Only actually, this idea is that creation is in the way, and since God created us, male and female, Genesis 1.27, God is fundamentally the ogre in all this since he created us with these biological constraints. See, you and I may see this in this way. Harrington, you know, doesn't say that exactly that way, but she does see that from a utilitarian perspective, the inconsistencies are very great. What today passes for feminism has come into clearer focus for this woman as something that is anti-woman. Hear Harrington's words, quote, the modern variety of, and she's talking about of Gnostic, a kind of a Gnosticism, Gnostic thinking, the modern variety seeks to transcend the physical, not through spiritual knowledge, but through technology. She goes on to say, this worldview sets women constitutively at odds with our own bodies. To realize ourselves, we must wage war on nature and even on the idea that we have a nature. Indeed, from a bio-libertarian perspective, waging war on the idea of nature is precisely what feminism should be doing. She goes on to say, nature is a set of physiological constraints that we didn't choose and that limit our ability to self-realize. In turn, this invites medical science to expand its sphere of control ever further beyond normal reproduction and to encompass ever more of our physical nature. The upshot is an order where matters are once deemed proper realm for philosophy or religious faith, such as questions of birth, death, or desire, are subcontracted to the machine. That is, if we have technological control, we don't need moral codes anymore, except what this produces is, in practice, a new code, a cyborg theology. The end goal of cyborg theology is delegitimizing the idea that we have a nature liquefying perhaps the most fundamental social norm of all, and in the process, opening profoundly disturbing new market possibilities." Unquote. So political prisoners in China are subject to involuntary organ harvesting. You know, somebody in the party gets your organs. And every kind of cut and paste surgery possible or that will become possible will be conducted to revise our bodily appearance to match our maybe confused internal imaginings about changing what we are. If I can change my nature, why not cut and paste until I've recreated myself? See, in Christianity, the believer and God interact cooperatively within the constraints of nature to be what we become. But in cyborg theology, as Harrington puts it, we recreate ourselves in contradiction to nature, in contradiction to God's creation. We erase what he made and replace it with what we make without him. Friends, I, I, I can't do justice to this book in such a limited space. I'm unashamedly focusing on the points she makes that are especially interesting to me. I come at this, you know, as a Christian person, I embrace a biblical worldview in which God is transcendent and he is the creator and designer of humans. He created humans in his image, that is, he made us as moral creatures, able to love and to appreciate beauty and to participate in God's fundamental givingness and benevolence toward his creatures. He made us unique individuals. We are not interchangeable. And one other point that I think is very striking that Harrington makes is reference to the singularity. There's an idea, you know, that we're going to come to a singularity and because of AI, artificial intelligence and all these things, uh, all these wonderful things are going to flow out from that and we're going into rainbows and unicorns right there. Well, Harrington warns us that, quote, the singularity has already occurred, which is what she says is, quote, the now normal experience of disembodied online sociology, unquote. So our author here posits that a great societal shift already has occurred. We're not, you know, just upstream from this singularity, like it's already up near to happening. We are already past it. We are downstream from it. This has already happened. 
There has already been a shift in society away from the actual and the face-to-face -to, -face to the virtual. And the virtual is invading the physical. Quote, she says, new branches of elective surgery are springing up filled with the promise that you can reskin not just your digital avatar, but also your meat avatar, unquote. She says this, if those reaching adulthood today are already natives of the world bequeathed to us by the real singularity, they are greeted with enthusiasm by thinkers who have long sought to merge us with our technologies. For the link between trans and tech is to some neither threat nor mental health crisis, but the key to an entire theology." Unquote. This, is, this is a manifestation, friends, of Paul's warning back there in Romans chapter 1, that when humans push God out of their reckoning, they turn to the worship of the creature. There is a theology here, but one in which humans have become God, small g. Well, although she might not be coming from a religious angle, I do believe that some of her conclusions are sound. For example, she says this, quote, we can't in fact be whoever we want to be. She says, constraints exist on what our future selves may realistically become. She says, whether at a small or large scale, human nature refuses to be entirely liquefied. And I find some hope in that. So, Mary Harrington, Feminism Against Progress, shows that some see through the transhumanist scam. It may not be that there is recognition that the Bible uh, way is the way, but there is recognition that progress theology and self-creation are mirages that have done harm to men and women who have embraced that thinking. Authors like Harrington are stepping back from the brink. It's a step in the right direction back toward the Creator, even if they may not fully see that in it. What I read is that the plastic cover has come off and the shiny metal underneath is showing defects. Progress is actually regress and they're recognizing this to be true. It is interesting to see others who now see that that which passes as today's feminism is toxic. Thank you, Mary Harrington, for your insightful book.